Welcome back. The much talked about federal carbon tax is set to increase tomorrow from 65 to $80 a ton and political divisions on the policy are at an all time high. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is now accusing conservative premiers who oppose the measure of misleading Canadians. But for ideological reasons or reasons of pure partisanship, conservative politicians across this country are not telling the truth to Canadians. And that's why I called them out. And I'm going to continue to call them out and remind them that if they really don't like our approach to pricing pollution, they can develop their own approach. The Prime Minister also released his own public letter to those premiers and challenged them to come up with a better climate action plan. The federal backstop, according to the government, aims to incentivize Canadians to reduce their own emissions while also providing quarterly rebates called the Canada Carbon Rebate. But for weeks, eight premiers, including Liberal, Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Andrew Fury, have been publicly urging the feds to pause the increase as Canadians face a cost of living crisis. Where do things go from here? Alberta Premier Danielle Smith is with us now. Hi, Premier. Good to see you as always. Thanks for making the time. You bet. Hi, Bashi. I know you appeared before committee this week to voice your opposition to that upcoming hike in the carbon tax. You argued it was immoral to levy the tax when Albertans are struggling with a cost of living crisis. Yet the provincial fuel tax is going up on the same day by four cents. How can you ask the federal government to provide relief to Albertans when you're not willing to? Well, part of it is that we've given $7 billion of relief over the past two years to try to compensate for what we've been seeing at the federal level. And we have a program that's in place so that as soon as oil prices get high again, if they go over $90, then the gas tax would come completely off. When it's below $80, it comes back on. And so uh, we're watching prices very closely. I, and I, I told the committee I'd be more than happy if the federal government did the same thing, because with their carbon tax, their fuel tax and the GST, they charge 35 cents on every tank of gas. And if they took the same approach that they would eliminate it when gas prices got too high, then we probably wouldn't have any complaint. What I gather from that, though, is that you see there to be a purpose in the fuel tax you've applied insofar as that money goes to pay for roads. From what the federal government says, they too see a purpose in levying the carbon tax, not to be punitive, but to affect behavior over the long term in order to reach this country's emissions targets. Isn't that valid as well? Well, I, I guess I, I need to see some evidence of that. Um, you had the, the environment minister, Stephen Guibo, so that he wasn't anticipating the carbon tax to make a difference until 2060. And so when you think about what behaviors are you trying to incent, well, part of it is you're trying to get people to buy zero emissions vehicles, which cost $60,000. You're trying to get them to change out their home heating systems, which can cost ten to $20,000. And you're, you're trying to, to, to get them to, to make really expensive changes to, to renovate their homes. And I, I just don't know that giving people a couple hundred bucks every quarter is going to incentivize that. There's other ways to be able to get those kind of changes. But it, this looks like a, just a shell game. It's a, a matter of taking money away, giving some of it back, and pre pretending you're doing something about the environment. I think most people see through it. I, I do understand raising the question because they hadn't yet provided a lot of evidence around how effective is this particular measure. But there is recently some outside evidence through the Canadian Climate Institute that says the uh, consumer portion of the carbon tax by 2030 will be worth a reduction in emissions of about eight to nine percent of the total. That's not nothing. What do you propose to displace that? Well, I, I can tell you what we are seeing displace that. There are some programs the federal government has and has partnered with us that do seem to be working. For instance, the carbon capture utilization and storage tax credit. We've announced ours. We think the federal government will be putting some structure around those very soon. That has resulted in um, Pathways, which is our bitumen producers, talking about creating a $16.5 billion carbon capture trunk line. We have partnered with the Strategic Investment Fund, which is uh, under the portfolio of uh, Francois Philippe Champagne on Dow Chemicals Net Zero, Petrochemical Plant, Air Products Net Zero, Hydrogen, Heidelberg's Net Zero Cement, um, Interpipeline on their ammonia project. Those are projects that are going to be net zero immediately after they're done. And I don't think that factors into anyone's modeling. But those are the kind of things that we need to do if we're going to make effective reductions in major industrial emissions. The issue, though, is that those don't come for free for taxpayers. You're proposing over the next decade, for example, to spend between three point two and five point three billion dollars of taxpayer money to fuel the development of carbon capture, for example, in your province. That's not nothing either. That costs taxpayers as well. Well, I would say that there's a, a lot of industry making uh, making money and it allows them to keep more of what they earn to be able to invest in these emissions reductions. That's, I think, a sensible way of doing it. 
when we've looked at our, our um, ACIP program, that's our, our program for petrochemical incentives, we, we've uh, determined that that has a payoff at of about 10 years with the extra taxes that those, those companies will end up paying. So those are the kind of approaches that we think are going to make sense, as opposed to putting an immediate burden on people who can least afford to pay it, those who are seniors, those who are low income. That's where we believe that the, the focus should be on the industrial emissions reduction, pricing that out, and making sure that we're holding those companies to account. But I, th I think it's just frustrating for people to continue to see a tax when the, the alternatives just simply aren't available to them. Is it, though, accurate to say that the industrial side of things will be more effective or, or less costly, I should say, for Albertans or for Canadians writ large? Again, those come with a very specific cost. It's just not as naked as the carbon tax. And when you talk about particularly impacting lower income and older Albertans or, or again, writ large Canadians, I mean, all the calculations the Parliamentary Budget Officer have done show that in those income brackets, in fact, they are getting more money back than they're paying in. Well, I would, I would say the only way we're going to make significant emissions reduction is at the industrial level. Because if Albertans are going to have a different type of, of fuel, maybe it's hydrogen, you need to build up the, the infrastructure for that. You need to be able to create the hydrogen, transport it, change out your pipeline system. But do you have evidence that the changes you're going to make, for example, more specifically, because you're talking more broadly, more specifically around carbon mm -hmm. capture, are going to do what you said? Are you sure you're going to get value for taxpayer money there? Well, look, we, we, we invested a, a billion dollars uh, 10 years ago to develop this Shell Quest project, and already it is it has captured 11.5 megatons of emissions. I know that uh, over in Saskatchewan, they have a, a similar type of uh, emissions reduction project, capture project that has captured 40 megatons of emissions. If we can align to a target of 2050, not only do I think we can achieve that, I, I think because I know our industry so well, they'll, they'll strive to do it even faster. But we, we, if you put an arbitrary limit in place that reduces production, reduces your revenues, you're going to impair the ability to invest in those kinds of projects. And I, I think that's self-defeating. Do you have evidence to support the idea or the characterization you're using that it's arbitrary? Because the federal government is aligning its targets with much of the rest of the world that has signed on to agreements, for example, through the UN about what the overall targets are by 2030, by 2035, and by 2050. And what they talk about is often, you know, reaching those targets in order to stop the warming that's happening. That is increasing the frequency with which we are seeing the impacts of climate change. So fires, let's say, man-made in many instances, but taking up a wider swath of land that Albertans will be very familiar with and happening more frequently. In your last budget, uh, spending expenses are up $2.1 billion from the previous year, largely due to $2.9 billion earmarked to deal with droughts, wildfires and floods. There is a cost of inaction around climate change as well. And I think the federal government would argue that means that their uh, dates, their targets are not arbitrary. Well, I guess I would say is uh, paying a, a carbon tax at the pump going to stop the fires in our province? And the answer is no. What stops the fires is number one, education, because 60% of them are human caused. Number two, building fire breaks so that we can protect communities. Number three, investing in water bomb equipment like de Havilland so that we can fight fires. Number four, sharing resources with the rest of the country through the Canadian Forest Fire Association. So I, I think the cause and effect are very different. You have to be able to deal with crises as they happen. So I'm watching to see with some evidence that the carbon tax is changing behavior. I just haven't seen it yet. But the point is for it to do so over a long period of time, not immediately, right? That's the, the point of incentivizing the behaviors. And to separate the idea that reducing emissions does mitigate the impact of climate change from fighting fires, of course, you have to do adaptation, as we were discussing, but that becomes more expensive if they happen more frequently. And though they are human caused, the frequency and the scope of them are a direct uh, impact of climate change. We will, we will always have fires. We will always have floods. We will always have ice storms. And the job of government is to make sure that we mitigate, that we are prepared for when they happen, and that we have the resources available to do, to do it. I, I, I can't, you have to make sure that you're budgeting for both of those things. And so that's why we have a plan to be a carbon neutral by 2050. But I, I just don't think that we punish people in the meantime. Let's build out the hydrogen infrastructure, build out the electrical infrastructure, make sure that we've got enough vehicles available for people to buy. And then we can start seeing the consumers change their behavior. But in the meantime, it, it really is just an extra tax. And I do really, sorry, I, I know time is limited, I just have a second, but I do understand the lack of alternatives, certainly, and those are pertinent questions for the federal government. But it sounds to me like you're delineating between 
fires happening and floods happening and mitigating the impacts of climate change. Do you not see them as the same thing? Well, I, I guess what I, what, I, what I don't see is that carbon tax is having an immediate impact on my, my pressing need each year to prepare for fires. Every year I'm going to need to prepare for fires. We've got an, an aging forest infrastructure. There's, our, our trees end up dying at about 100 years old. So we've got an aging forest infrastructure. We had the El Nino effect this year. We had a devastating fire season last year. It still means that I've got to pay for that. I, I can't just hope that a, a carbon tax is going to stop fires from burning in my province. We've, we've got to be able to do both. And we have to be able to do both on a time scale that, that makes sense. So I'm going to be planning for fires this year. We hope that they're not devastating. And uh, over the course of the, the next 25 years, we'll be reducing emissions by finding different alternatives, using innovation, and uh, making sure that we get to carbon neutral by 2050. But I, I just don't think when we're in this, uh, the middle of this affordability crisis that increasing the cost of everything for individuals when they can't avoid those costs, I just don't think that's fair. I don't think it's right. Premier, I'll leave it on that note. I appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much. You bet, thank you. After a quick break, federal budget kickoff. The feds launch a new strategy that aims to announce almost the entire budget before its table. What is the point of that and will it work? Who better to answer that question than our Sunday strategy session with Kathleen Moncori tonight and Scott Reed. They're here next. More question period just ahead.